Good morning. My name is Mark Baldessari, and I'm President and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. Thank you for joining us today. PPIC is pleased to present this program on a very important topic, tackling homelessness in California. This event is part of PPIC's 2020 speaker series on California's future. We would like to thank the sponsors of this series for their underwriting support. These organizations are listed on your screen and on our website. This series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Before we begin, if you have a question for our speakers, and several of you have already sent questions this morning, please send an email to the address on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the course of uh, the next hour. We'd appreciate you including your name and organization along with your question. Now on to today's program. It comes at a time of unparalleled challenges for the state and the nation, and we look to our elected officials for their guidance and their leadership. That is why I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers today. Los Angeles County Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas and Mayor Daryl Stanberg, Sacramento, have served in state and local government and are co-chairs of the Governor's Homeless Task Force. I'd like to thank you both very much for your public service. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to be here, Mark. We very much appreciate you joining us today for this conversation. Thank you. It's really nice to see you too. Likewise. You too. So my first question, um, as you know, PPIC does surveys. Our first survey of the year found that homelessness was the top issue for the first time in the history of the survey in our January PPIC survey. The last survey we conducted, um, COVID-19 was the top issue in the May PPIC survey. So what's the most important thing California can do to address homelessness during the pandemic. Who would like to speak first? My, my esteemed colleague from Los Angeles, please. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor Steinberg and Mark again. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate. Um, I think it's clear that um, uh, homelessness persists and I wanna say from the start uh, that once we have more effectively managed uh, the, the crisis that we call coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. Um, and I suspect we will get to a point where we can <clears throat> uh, feel a bit more comfortable about uh, where things are. Uh, the issue of homelessness will still persist. I've described it in terms of um, a crisis within a crisis. And when we think about that, um, uh, our obligation uh, from my point of view is to as best and as immediately, as urgently as possible, uh, address the uh, most vulnerable among us in terms of the homeless population. Uh, this is essentially to lay claim to what uh, both Mayor Steinberg and myself sought to uh, advance uh, as co-chairs of the Governor's Task Force on Homelessness uh, to say that equity does matter. <clears throat> Disproportionality is relevant and to the extent that we know uh, that we have um, a significant number of persons of color, particularly African Americans, dif um, disproportionately represented in the uh, context of the homeless population, uh, we have an obligation to understand that and to address that uh, programmatically, financially, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no two ways about it. It seems to me that we have to step up and this provides us with a significant opportunity to do so. And uh, we have sought to do that through Project Room Key. That's to deal with those who are 65 and older who have underlying health uh, conditions that overlaps with um, healthcare disparity. It points directly to persons of color, 
disproportionately, again, African-Americans. And so, Mark, I think um, this pandemic uh, has uh, pushed the question of the state of emergency forward. Uh, I've maintained, uh, the mayor has maintained that homelessness is tantamount uh, to a state of emergency for the state of California. And to the extent that that is the case, we should behave accordingly, organize our political will, uh, put forth uh, our resources um, uh, at the federal, state, and local levels uh, to address this issue with the kind of intentionality that it warrants. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again, Mark, for um, for having me. It's wonderful to be with you even remotely. And uh, my friend, Mark Ridley-Thomas, um, thank you for all the great work you are doing uh, in you. Los Angeles combating uh, not only homelessness, but uh, the multiple crises we are all called upon to deal mm -hmm. with at the same time. I do think there is a strong connection between the crises of our day and the crisis which we identified in your survey identified as the number one concern of people prior to uh, February of 2020. For the coronavirus is an identified public health emergency that affects everyone. The truth of the matter is homelessness has always been a public health emergency. It's just that because it does not affect the entire population, although it does, it actually does. Indirectly, uh, yes. It has been um, uh, a strong but uphill push for the political bodies uh, and for the public to, to see homelessness for what it is. An unacceptable state of affairs and a social condition that no civil society should tolerate. And homelessness was a public health crisis prior to COVID-19. It has elevated as a result, as more, as we've emptied jails and as people have uh, unfortunately lived even further off the edge and have become homeless. And if we continue to do what we demonstrated we could do during the epidemic through Project Room Key and other strategies, we actually have a chance to change the trajectory. And then finally, I just wanna to add to the point that Supervisor Ridley Thomas made a moment ago. We can use the word systemic racism and we must use them um, to describe the, uh, and acknowledge um, what our greatest challenge remains in America in 2020. If there is no greater example of systemic racism than the fact that 6.5% of Californians identify themselves as African American or black, and yet 40% of the homeless population is African American, I don't know what can better describe systemic racism. Because when you go back upstream and ask how people became homeless in the first place, and the lack of economic opportunities, the, the implicit and explicit racism that has existed and continues to exist in our society, that statistic is stark, it is disturbing, and it's our call uh, to change it. Uh, thank you. And uh, I wanna stay on the topic of um, racial inequities uh, for a moment. Uh, today is um, a day with which uh, people across the United States are uh, observing Juneteenth. Um, the two of you acknowledge the fact that um, African-Americans are disproportionately among the homeless. And um, we've uh, really been focused uh, the last few weeks in particular since the tragic death of George Floyd at the deep racial inequities um, in our nation. Um, can you uh, take a moment to uh, explain in the case of homelessness, um, 
how we've gotten to the point of this um, this uh, clear, clear racial disparity and um, what can be done? Well, Mark, I think um, if I may, <clears throat> Um, some would describe it as the fundamental contradiction in American society, that of race. Um, and it has been the, the struggle uh, of America since its founding. Um, and in part, that means a lack of willingness to confront it, even at the point of the Constitution, where African Americans, Africans uh, were not even... Uh, referenced in terms of uh, being characterized as three-fifths of a human being. No reference to uh, the particularity of this uh, ethnic uh, group remain nameless, uh, essentially uh, relegating them to a status of anonymity and subhumanity. And so it starts there and no doubt predates that move all the way through systems of Jim Crow um, um, and well beyond. And so uh, this could very well be uh, a history lesson in uh, racial justice. Uh, but let me just simply fast forward to some of the insidious aspects of it. Uh, the mayor makes reference to disproportionality in terms of, of uh, the issue of African Americans being um, stacked so deeply uh, among the, the homeless. Uh, it is not to be ignored that uh, the County of Los Angeles through the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority produced uh, a report um, um, approximately 18 months ago on African Americans experiencing homelessness in LA County. Now, the extent to which they were experiencing homelessness is not a new thing. What's new is that someone finally organized themselves to do um, uh, the work. Um, and I want to acknowledge Jacqueline Wagner, my appointee to, home, to the uh, Homeless Authority uh, for leading uh, the way and the organization for taking it up. It's not just Los Angeles that was the first time. This was the first such report in the nation Hmm. I'm speaking to the insidiousness of racism. Uh, so you ignore the very people who have been denied, who have been denigrated, who have been uh, demeaned um, for uh, low these many years in the context of robbing them of their dignity uh, on every single day. And so the fundamental assertion that is made uh, in that report uh, that you can't get around is uh, the disproportionality is fundamentally driven by racism. Mm -hmm. in the education system, the healthcare system, uh, and in employment opportunities um, uh, shot through the lives of the individuals who seek uh, to uh, stand up and be treated as uh, persons of worth and dignity. Um, and so that's what we are dealing with. And then they come with some 67 recommendations, uh, which uh, we are beginning to try to implement. And so there's no getting around this. The question is, are we willing to be serious enough to confront this question uh, in real terms and in real time? That's what we have to come to grips with. Uh, no two ways about it. And that's why I think this conversation is so important has to be straight talk here and now. May I, Mark? Yes. Yeah. You, just, you think about the arc of history and how great advances do not represent the end of the struggle. Uh, today is Juneteenth, uh, which marks, um, in one sense, the end of slavery and the emancipation. But that was only the beginning, not the end, because we, we still had and have had Jim Crow, and we still had uh, the Ku Klux Klan and decades of pushback on, on the African-American, the lives of African-Americans who were freed from slavery, but were not freed from oppression. And then you 
jumpstart. And of course, there are many chapters in between, but you go fast forward to the 1960s in the Civil Rights Act, where African Americans were guaranteed, and I use that in quotes, that they would not be discriminated against uh, when they applied for housing. And that was a great advance. Mm -hmm. But now jump forward to 2020 and you look at these statistics. In my county, 34% of people experiencing homelessness are African American, but comprise only 13% of the overall population. And while there may be a right to be free from outright discrimination in housing, there is certainly no right to housing. Yeah. There is no right to housing. And so I think now is the time where, and this has been a, a significant focus of the state of emergency as Supervisor Ridley Thomas has rightfully coined it over these many months. This has been one of the lead ideas coming out of uh, our task force work and these discussions. It is no longer enough to say you're free from outright discrimination when you seek to be housed. Mm -hmm. It is time to now say you have an absolute right to be housed. Mm -hmm. uh, for homelessness is, ought to be unacceptable as a matter of law, not just as a matter of moral outrage. And this is where I believe in 2020, and I hope we get into this in a little bit more detail, or we have the opportunity now to take that next great step and that next great stride uh, around the issue of civil, human, and legal rights in our, mm -hmm. in our America and in California. Thank you. Um, so one of our uh, questions, which uh, leads in um, nicely to some uh, current events that I wanted to get to. Uh, one of our questions from a woman named Janice uh, from an organization called Brothers and Sisters in Communication said, it's not every day you have a federal court order on homelessness, but we had a federal court order on homelessness. Um, and another questioner uh, said um, uh, specifically for Supervisor Ridley Thomas, what's been your role in the federal court order from Judge Carter, how will this impact the homeless work taking place in the County of Los Angeles? So I wonder if we might talk about the role of courts and the, and the rights as we just referred to, um, specifically in Los Angeles, but then more generally, maybe uh, Mayor Seinberg can, can address that issue as we get into the right of having housing. Supervisor yeah. Ridley Thomas, how, what's the importance of this uh, federal ruling? Well, um... I thought you were going to uh, begin with Mayor Steinberg because he has an affinity for the courts. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I tend to be a bit wary of the courts, but I uh, wish to say that we um, uh, were sued um, by individuals who were just fed up with the lack of progress on the part of the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles. Uh, Alliance for Human Rights um, uh, came forward and, and um, got the attention of the federal courts to do so. Um, uh, judge Carter, David Carter was then named to be the presiding judge. He's also ably assisted by uh, Judge Andre uh, Barat. Um, and uh, the thrust of it has essentially been um, to compel uh, these two local entities to step up to the plate in a non-negotiable way. Mm -hmm. um, and this squares in part, Mark, with uh, what both uh, Mayor Steinberg and I um, we're trying to drive forward <clears throat> um, when we co-chaired the governor's task force, essentially to ratchet up the obligation um, uh, for local government to address the issue 
in a way that is not simply discretionary, that's not uh, negotiable, but is clear and um, uh, required, and the lack of compliance then would have consequences. And so this, in effect, flows out of this. Mm -hmm. I've watched this long enough to know unless there is an obligation that attaches to what has to happen with this matter of addressing homelessness, it will not happen. Other priorities will um, find their way on top of it. And I, I wanna say this as uh, bluntly as I can, some of what I think happens uh, is uh, the, the incipient notion of uh, the contempt for the poor supplants mm -hmm. our drive to make it a priority to elevate them uh, from the status uh, that they currently occupy mm -hmm. uh, without full enough appreciation for the fact it's very costly to maintain a homeless population uh, in terms of public safety, in terms of um, the healthcare delivery system. Uh, it is hugely taxing. We've studied all of that. And so the judge uh, said, you will uh, effectively uh, deal with this. And he uh, came forward and essentially declared that uh, the freeway adjacent encampments would have to be cleared by September of 2020. Mm -hmm. That was his order. Both the city and the county said, well, just hold on here. How do you get there? Um, and uh, essentially, um, indicated that we would appeal uh, if such were to be the case. We ultimately landed in a place of mediation so that the city and the county can work it out, uh, but we would prioritize those who are 65 and older. Why? Because from an equity perspective, from a fairness principle that we would apply, those are the individuals who are most vulnerable, not the persons who are freeway adjacent. They need help too, but they are typically younger, they are uh, more healthy, and there are uh, less persons of color there. The disproportionate impacts l are located elsewhere. And so we had to have our own sense of uh, what's right, what's fair, what's proper, what's equitable in the context of this discussion. And I think uh, what you see, uh, Mark and Mr. Mayor, is a result that effectively um, expresses trying to reconcile the judge's priority with the priorities that the providers, uh, the experts in the subject matter have essentially said, these are they who need our attention most and now we will go forward. And yet our feet must be kept to the fire in order to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, thousands, we're talking about thousands. Um, Approximately 7,000. Seven it's a thousand. big deal. It's a big deal yeah. if we uh, can be called to do it, but accountability matters. Yeah. And so there's going to be a public transparency uh, process. Uh, mm -hmm. There will be articulated um, milestones uh, uh, that have to happen that will be that will be accountable to the court, but also accountable mm -hmm. in the context of Measure H, mm -hmm. our, um, our sales tax based resources for homelessness and absent Measure H. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do any of this because right. the dollars that are coming forth for services and operations uh, that the county will supply effectively support what the city intends to do, which is to provide the beds. And that means building structures uh, and the like, but it goes directly to what Mayor Steinberg is saying. There is a right uh, to a roof, a right to uh, mm -hmm. a door, a right to shelter, a right to housing, anything less than that, uh, denigrates and denies the full dignity of the persons who are homeless. Uh, Mayor Steinberg, what's the significance of this ruling and the role of the courts? I mean, you're somebody who uh, has been involved in the executive branch, the legislative branch, and um, here we have the courts involved. And uh, we know from other examples, and I'm thinking about prison overcrowding, just all sorts of other examples we've heard from the Supreme Court a number of times this week, um, this to me is, um, when, when I read about it, it's very, very unique and, and maybe opens up a new chapter. But how do you see this in terms well, of the courts? Well, first of all, I, I really uh, 
Mark and I tease each other back and forth a little bit, but I totally associate myself with what he said a moment ago, because I think it was really well said. It might surprise you though, to, to hear that while I think the role of courts can, and in this case, dem, uh, can be very important. I don't think courts should be the first resort here mm -hmm. because they have limitations as well. I actually believe that what Judge Carter is doing and the structure of what the city and county are doing uh, <clears throat> put into state law and into state statute, if not the state constitution. Mm -hmm. And and really, I, I think we, Mark and I can both humbly say uh, that this Alliance lawsuit, which precipitated uh, Judge Carter's ruling, actually came out of our work and our task force's work. I think that's- And they, and they acknowledge that. And that, that's in part where it was born, so- uh, it, Excuse me, uh, Daryl, but could you, could you kind of make, uh, yeah, yeah, so there. it, it was the deal. Mark and I both came out um, very early last summer and said there needs to be a right to a roof over one's mm -hmm. head. I started out with a right to shelter. We went to a right to a roof over one's head because we were intellectually trying to reason through mm -hmm. what would be the best frame, not just message wise, but substantively to create an actual right to housing in California. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up with is now um, encompassed in a bill by the chair of the Assembly Housing uh, Committee, Assembly Member David Chu, it's Assembly Bill 3269, with super, which Supervisor Ridley Thomas and I are the, are, are the co-sponsors of. And it takes our recommendations and it seeks to put them in a statute. And basically what it says, is that every city and county in California and the state needs to reduce its homeless numbers by 90% by 2028 mm -hmm. and needs to make aggressive progress uh, towards meeting those numbers between now and that ultimate and that ultimate goal. The bill calls for the establishment of an inspector, state inspector general, who would have the ability actually to bring a lawsuit just mm -hmm. as in the, the case in Los Angeles, where a city or a county was not meeting the benchmarks or at least not doing everything within their, within their resources that they have to meet mm -hmm. the benchmarks. And, and there are two principles that underlie this really. Uh, maybe there are many, but two lead principles. Number one, and Mark said this earlier, if it matters, it should be required. Hmm. When you step back and you think about this, and we've said this many times, name another area of major public policy uh, where everything that government is called upon to do is voluntary or optional. Hmm. That's not the case with renewable portfolio standards around climate change. It's a mandate. It's not the case with public schools. Free public education is a right, not an option. Hmm. Why, when we've got hundred plus thousand people on our streets. <clears throat> and it's the number one issue identified by the people of California, at least prior to uh, COVID. Why is it that everything that cities and counties in the state are called upon to do is optional? And you know what that optionality leads to? It leads to all kinds of dysfunction. It means to, it, it leads to jurisdictions not being required to consolidate resources where appropriate, to work across uh, jurisdictional lines, to actually get the money that they have and we have out faster, to focus on what's most important, which is putting a safe roof over people's heads. There's just a lot of inefficiency and ineffectiveness along with a lot of great work. But we've got to drive towards uh, 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 an enforceable, goal here if we're going to make uh, a, a real difference here. Um, and, and so this is what is in play now where there is an opportunity to change this from uh, something that uh, wouldn't it be nice uh, if we made greater progress. Mm -hmm. Setting up the legal mechanisms by statute 
with an inspector general, not as a first resort, but a last resort, to actually move towards where we all not only want to go, but where we need to go, which is to, which is to end this social condition. There are a lot of questions within the framework, including how do we help people who are currently housed not become homeless? Mm -hmm. That's as big an issue as how we get people off the streets. But um, if, it, if it matters, you require it. If it really doesn't matter, then you just say, do the best you can. And we know what the people are saying here. Yeah. 3269 and Judge Carter um, and what Mark is doing in Los Angeles County with his colleagues is part of changing uh, the paradigm of how we look at these issues, appropriately so. Thank you. Um, and, and Mark, let, if I may, <clears throat> this isn't uh, devoid of moral content. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that this is in part the, uh, the opportunity over the past several years to rediscover our moral compass here. Mm -hmm. We neglected this population. It was left unattended. And the only thing it did was got worse and worse. And now we're faced with uh, what we describe as inflow uh, that is so potent until uh, the extraordinary amassing of resources, for example, in Los Angeles that we've done through the city of Los Angeles with, Propos with Proposition Triple H and the county of Los Angeles with Measure H, um, uh, combined nearly $5 billion to aim at this issue over the, the decade, is e effectively being outstripped by the economic insecurity, the lack of affordable housing. And so uh, this data ought to get your uh, attention. 207 people are exiting homelessness every single day in the county of Los Angeles, mm. only to be uh, supplanted effectively by 227 uh, individuals who enter homelessness every single day uh, in Los Angeles. These numbers are large for a variety of reasons, but uh, I suspect any other region in the nation would shout hallelujah and clap their hands if they could get 200 people, seven people out of homelessness every day. Sure. Um, and so I, I simply want to uh, assert that this uh, notion of a right, an, an enforceable obligation, mm -hmm. uh, is hardly a new notion it goes back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. uh, it's predated by that by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his, uh, one of his inaugural addresses said there should be a second bill of rights in this nation and included in that is the right to housing. Mm -hmm. And so the question really becomes, when will we take that seriously enough to do what we know we can and mm -hmm. should do from a moral perspective, from a policy perspective and from a fiscal mm -hmm. perspective? Yes. Um, so prior to the pandemic, at least from what we can tell from the numbers that have been gathered, we've seen that the homeless population has been growing. And I wanted to get a sense from both of you on the ground in the communities in which you live. Uh, and uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, you mentioned the, the, the inflow, but uh, for both of you, from your perspective as people who are running a statewide task force, what are you seeing on the ground in terms of the size and complexity of, uh, of homelessness. Um, yeah. As we now face a very high unemployment um, right. in the state. So are you seeing, what are you seeing in terms of numbers and complexity of the issue? And are we accounting for that in, in how we plan going forward? You want me to start, I'll start on this one. First of all, I think it's important that we- What are you seeing in Sacramento? Well, what we, we are seeing the tale of two cities. Uh, so okay. I do think it is really important to give a shout out here to Governor Newsom. Um, mm -hmm. Because this Project Room Key was not just, um, you know, invented, uh, you know, from the bottom up. Um, he saw homelessness as, uh, as one of the key uh, issues around the pandemic. 
And so was very aggressive in working with the, the federal government, uh, 75% FEMA reimbursement, 19% state reimbursement, 6% right. local. And what Project Room Key has demonstrated is that if we put our mind to it, if we work across jurisdiction lines, in my, in my part of the world, let's just say the city and county had not worked as closely together as we should on these issues for a variety of reasons. Project Room Key, at least for now, has changed that because we are uh, working not only very closely together, but we have brought record numbers of people indoors, now over 800 in our city, I know it's different scale than Los Angeles, um, into these motels um, with the help of the state and the federal government. And that's great state leadership. I also think it's, it's good local leadership. Mm. Um, but the problem, of course, is that the numbers are actually worse overall. The Supervisor Ridley Thomas mentioned, you know, in part, look at the law of unintended consequences. Because of COVID, the uh, Judicial Council understandably had to issue these no bail orders. Yeah. The county jail was thinned out. Mm -hmm. A lot of those folks end up right back on our streets. And then the biggest thing I'm worried about, and I'm pleased to see that the legislature is thinking about how they deal with people who are going to owe all kinds of back rent um, once the state of emergency ends. How are we going to set up or require payment plans so that, yes, the landlord is made whole, but the tenant does not face immediate or even short, medium term or long term eviction because they can't make up all that back rent in a short period of time. That is my number one worry. Hmm. Because if, if we allow that issue to go unattended and more people become homeless because they can't pay that rent or that back rent as a result of COVID-19, then shame on us. And shame on us if we aren't absolutely committed to ensuring that everybody that has been brought into these motels finds a longer term place to live. Nobody turned back out on the street. That's the minimum that we have to do. So there was a question from um, Noreen, a UCLA graduate student said, I learned that project room key intake has ended. Could you confirm this? If so, can you ensure greater unhoused populations are supported with safe housing? And what is the plan to safely transition the 3,600 individuals placed in this program? So a multi part well, question. Well, it is, and it has not ended. Not ended, uh, okay. We uh, continue to house people. We are at now uh, just above uh, 3,500, uh, quickly moving toward uh, 4,000 okay. persons in Los Angeles. Um, some uh, 34 hotels under motels have participated. Uh, so it's a win-win in many respects. Um, mm -hmm. Some might describe it in terms of a triple bottom line here. Um, we're helping the 65 and older uh, population, who I have said earlier is uh, the most vulnerable population among those who are homeless. Um, we're helping um, uh, address the issues of the uh, employment because the individuals who were um, uh, no longer able to work at the hotels because that industry is practically decimated. And then we're helping with respect to the a business climate because these in the, these um, hotels then can fill up and uh, do what needs to be done in terms of paying their taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And so I believe that there uh, is a lot to be said for it. So proposition, uh, I should say project room key is an expression of innovation and collaboration that ought to be uh, effectively celebrated. Daryl uh, uh, made reference to it in terms of federal, state, and local uh, participation from a financial perspective. And that's uh, a good thing. But with respect to the uptick in homelessness uh, in the uh, uh, Los Angeles region, it's approximately 13%. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can feel it, you can see it. Uh, we are adversely affected by it um, and uh, among those who are 62 and older, it, the uptick is 20%. Um, and so this population 
stands out as being the most vulnerable. That's why we have to uh, focus on them with greater intensity. In Los Angeles, uh, two to three people, according to the county uh, coroner, the chief medical officer, die every single day owing to being homeless. Um, on an annual basis now, it's moving toward a thousand people. That's twice the number of people who die from violent crime in uh, mm. this region. And so there's no way to deny uh, what we are contending with. And it seems to me uh, that um, we have to uh, take a close note of this uptick uh, against the national backdrop. Uh, I'm, um, I am wanted to call to the attention um, of the viewers here that uh, Columbia University makes a claim, makes a claim that um, owing to depression-like unemployment rates, it will drive uh, the issue of homelessness up as much as 40 to 45 percent across the nation. In California, they suggest that it will be approximately uh, 20 percent. Well, a 20 percent uptick in homelessness in California uh, is not a good thing by any standard of measurement. We are already the epicenter of homelessness in the nation. Uh, and so, uh, Mark, um, we have our, our hands full. I'm going to put on my, my homeless services hat right now because this is the right. count that we, we engaged in. We, we, we went out 8,000 volunteers mm -hmm. uh, counted. This is the largest uh, census other than the uh, census that's done by the federal government mm -hmm. on uh, every 10 years. 8,000 people every year go out and try to make sense of what's going on in terms of our reality. And I, I, I just have to say uh, they are to be applauded for that work. Uh, our hands are, are full. You ask the question when we, I was talking with some of the lawyers, uh, and yes, Daryl, I do talk to lawyers. Uh, I, um, I, um, uh, they left the, the court uh, yesterday and walked back to the County Hall of Administration. Uh, and the issue wasn't legal. The issue wasn't abstract. The issue wasn't academic. It was real. Uh, the persons that they um, had to uh, navigate um, around in order to get back to uh, uh, their places of, of work. It's, uh, this is profoundly real and equally disturbing and it's upticking as we speak. And so I, I believe we have to uh, work harder. We have to work smarter. We have to work faster and it needs to be riveted by a sense of obligation. That's one, not of our, a, one of our um, uh, audience participants today um, asks about um, social workers yeah. and the highly specialized um, need uh, particularly um, in the mental health field. And it was related to a question that I wanted to ask the two of you. Um, and that's um, how do you, yeah, how do you think about that linkage between mental health and homelessness, which I think if we think about solutions to homelessness, we can't avoid the fact that, um, that mental health issues um, send, uh, you know, tend to be uh, part of the reason that uh, people fall into homelessness and um, certainly once in homelessness, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, are, are dealing with uh, tremendous stress and depression and um, how, how do we tackle the issue of mental health? Could I, I'll, I'll give you one, one answer. And of course, this mental health is the most visible, mentally ill homeless are the most visible manifestation. Yeah of the unaddressed issue of our time, maybe in addition to systemic racism. Right. And that is our, our failure to treat the brain uh, in the same way we treat the body. And I know it's been a big part of my life's work and it continues, but I wanna tie it to police reform for a moment. Okay. Um, because uh, this week I noted in uh, the city and maybe the County of Los Angeles as well, um, a set of ideas and Monday I made a very specific proposal in my capital city here in which I suggested the following. Um, in response to the defund movement, which I'm not sure is the 
best frame, nor do I necessarily agree with, with all of it. But I think that there is a, there is a real truth here. Mm -hmm. and the truth is that the 911 system makes our police force the first and last resort for virtually every crisis call in our communities, whether or not the call has anything to do with the uh, allegation of a serious crime being committed. Yeah. And not only does it put our law enforcement officials in untenable positions, uh, they're not adequately trained uh, to do this kind of work, but frankly, when you're dealing with people either on our streets or, um, or who are in various crisis situations. The presence of a gun, a uniform, a baton invokes fear and trauma and often results in a terrible outcome. And so what I've called for this week in my city is to actually create a new department of non-law enforcement response of 911 around homelessness, mental health, CPS, other uh, categories and to shift money from the police department to establish this new unit. And I think it has the potential to be transformative, not just in my city, but throughout the state and the country to redefine what we expect of our police officers. But frankly, I got another motive and that motive is to build up the mental health <laughs> and the resources and the infrastructure so that we can uh, make this the priority that it, it desperately needs to be. Hmm. Thank you. Supervisor? Yeah, I am um, in full agreement with the need for alternatives to uh, incarceration. Uh, we've advanced a rather extensive uh, study and report in the County of Los Angeles to that effect. Um, um, the efforts of both uh, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl and myself and the balance of the board uh, have led on this. Uh, Dr. Robert Ross, um, CEO of the California Endowment, chaired the, um, mm -hmm. the task force. Um, and um, a lot is going on in the way of diversion. A lot is going on in the way of elevating uh, the policy agenda of mental health. Dr. John Sharon is engaged in that. Uh, uh, Mayor Steinberg is uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Sharon on this front. So there's a lot going on uh, here. And, and mental health is critically important um, when we think about homelessness, uh, but it has been far and away eclipsed by the economic um, instability that people experience. And not everyone who is homeless particularly when they first become homeless, um, uh, suffers from a mental health um, condition, if you will. But in fact, the longer you stay unhoused, uh, the more challenging it becomes. Um, mm -hmm. If you fall out of your uh, unit as a tenant and end up having to sleep in your uh, vehicle, if you should have one, and if you happen to have a family uh, such with children, uh, taking them to school, trying to navigate all of that, you could be employed. Uh, I can tell you at a certain point in time, it will wear you down. Uh, and a range of mental health issues do then uh, emerge. There's no two questions about that. Um, and I think uh, the point that I would like to make uh, uh, additionally is when we think about life expectancy, I mean, this is uh, homelessness provides a tremendous opportunity in terms of intersectionality of study, right? And so when you think about homeless people, they die much earlier than their counterparts uh, in society. When you think about um, uh, those with mental health challenges, they die earlier than their counterparts. And this is all documentable. Uh, when you think about African Americans, their life expectancy is less than their counterparts. And so there are ways to analyze this and understand uh, where it is that we should um, uh, intervene from, and not simply a political perspective, but the healthcare uh, industry needs to be 
attuned to this in a significant way. Co-occurring disorders uh, and the like, not the language that would have been used 25 years ago, but we understand it now mm -hmm. and we need to uh, be on top of that. And so uh, social workers, critically uh, important. We started with some um, 50 uh, to 100 uh, outreach teams, Mark and Daryl in the county of Los Angeles um, about five years ago uh, at, on Skid Row. Now we have approximately a thousand persons. Mm -hmm. uh, my plea is to make that 2,000. We need an army uh, addressing this issue uh, of homelessness. And it squares quite nicely with uh, the non-enforcement department uh, uh, that the mayor just uh, mentioned. We've been doing that now. We need to name, name, label it and do it even better. Thank you. Uh, one a question came in uh, from a private citizen, Lenny, saying that Mayor Schaff, who was also on your task force, um, mayor of Oakland, ordered many homes at record time and cost how does construction innovation like what is done in this case uh, figure into the equation so that we can house the homeless at speed and scale and at a cost less than the average down payment for homes outside of California? I'll try this one. about housing production. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a provocative statement here. I think that there is a terrible bias in our state around what we used to call transitional housing. Hmm. Um, and obviously permanent housing should always be the goal, but we um, accept again, the fact that it takes years um, at huge expense, half a million to six to $700,000 of subsidy per unit to build a, a conventional unit of permanent supportive housing. And what that says is a value statement is that we don't, we, we aren't, serious about a right to housing. We're not serious about the volume of people that are out on our streets. And I think part of the answer must lie in housing innovation. Hmm. Because ma th these manufactured housing projects, while they may not have a useful life of 30 years and thus meet the strict HUD definition of what constitutes permanent housing, the fact of the matter is their quality, the products I've seen are of great quality. Mm. And if a home lasts for five to seven years and gets somebody off the street five to seven years while they then can maybe find permanent housing, isn't that better than what it is we are living with now? And they are less expensive. They're faster to build. And, and, and many of the products are safe. I think there needs to be a housing revolution in this state around innovative housing types, but that's not exactly where the, where, where the culture and the mindset is, in part because we are stuck, if you will, on, that, on what we know, mm. which is more conventional, which is the end goal, but it's hugely mm. expensive and it takes too long. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, anything? I, 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 I agree with that. I would just simply make it more pointed. It's the, the status quo is what it is because of vested interest. Yeah. There are people who benefit from building um, housing as you described in a conventional way. Uh, that which is uh, less conventional mm -hmm. um, uh, would uh, bring forth another set of um, priorities and uh, rules um, and lawmaking and the like, but we've got to get there because we have to move faster, mm -hmm. smarter uh, than uh, is the case because we are being outstripped by this. I talked about the inflow. Um, there's mm -hmm. just no way to get around it. So innovation, 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 Mark. Um, so you two are experienced leaders uh, and have many accomplishments um, in your careers. And I, I, I'd be interested if you could just tell me um, how you uh, would define success in terms of the, the task force that you were co-chairing. If each of you could spend a minute on that or so, we're, we're very short on time. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I think uh, the fact that we have a partner in Sacramento, namely the governor, mm -hmm. has made all the difference in 
the world. Um, the allocation of resources um, in year one and now year two of his uh, term uh, has been huge. He has an enlightened um, team working with him. Uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mark Galley, is on point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we are already are making uh, progress of consequence. Uh, and some of us are just determined not to turn back. Uh, we cannot, and we will not. I, I would agree with uh, that, of course. We do have this tremendous opportunity with the governor who's willing to put his money and his, and his policy uh, agenda uh, front and center here. I, I, I would conclude by saying that flipping this on its head and saying that from here on in California, a legally enforceable obligation to bring people indoors and or a right to a roof over your head or housing will begin to change the trajectory and the paradigm in a way that will bring real results. And look at LA County and what happened yesterday, I think is the, the best example in real time of how that is possible. 7,000 people will now come indoors who may not have come indoors um, without that push and that force. And um, we can do this. We don't have to accept this situation and the status quo as it is. Well, I wanna close by saying what gives me hope that we'll make progress in tackling homelessness in California is talking to the two of you today. Thank you, Mark. And if there's anything that we can do at PPIC to be helpful, please let me know. This is a very, very important problem. It's been a, a very, very good conversation today. And I'd like to thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas and Mayor Steinberg for joining us today. Enjoyed it. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. And finally, thanks to all of you for joining us today online. If you're pre-registered for the event later today, you'll be receiving a survey and we hope you'll take a couple of minutes to let us know how we did. And um, for all of you, um, once again, thank you for, uh, for joining us. And our next virtual event will be on July 17th. You'll be hearing about that. Um, the title of that is New Realities for Higher Education. Please be safe and have a good afternoon. And thank you very much.